Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise, and uh, welcome to the first panel of uh, 2021. And uh, I think a good number of you would be tuning in from UK. So I hope uh, you're all staying safe. I know there's another lockdown happening there right now. And uh, the first panel in 2021, we're going to discuss if circular business models are mainstream. We have Emma Burlow, who recently started her own business, Lighthouse Sustainability. And uh, she is going to be discussing this topic with a couple of others who are essentially uh, part of her hashtag CE100 series. So if you have to know more about the series, please head to her LinkedIn and uh, you will see the entire series, which she launched in Feb 2020. And Emma is a specialist in circular economy and is focused on making circular, circularity accessible and simple for everyone to adopt. And uh, with Lighthouse Sustainability, she's going to be working with businesses to help them become leaders in sustainability. And uh, today she's talking to Anthony Burns, who's the Chief Operating Officer at ACS Clothing, and Nick Rockins, founder and CEO of Rethinking Electronics. And uh, I am Shweta Vindapani. I am the community builder at BeWasteWise. In case you don't know about BeWasteWise already, BeWasteWise is a nonprofit organization. We try to address the need for knowledge dissemination in waste management. And uh, we try to build a global waste community that uh, spreads across multiple geographies. So as usual, please drop in your questions in the Q&A box. Emma will be taking them as and when they're pertinent to the conversation. If you've already sent in your question, they've already been sent to Emma and she's incorporated them in the initial set of questions that she has for our panelists. So that's about it. Over to you, Emma. Great, thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, wherever you're uh, dialing in from. So um, it's really great to be here. This is the third in a series of, of um, webinars that I've done with the Race Vice. Uh, today we're going to look at um, circularity becoming more mainstream. So one of the things that I do in my work is try to talk about circularity in everyday life um, because sometimes it's it's framed as a niche idea or a high risk um, you know, route for businesses to take. So I try to demystify that and make it very practical. And in my series, as Sveta was saying, I look at companies and and services and even public sector organizations that are already doing a lot of circular activities. I am, um, you know, make this more normal for people so people can adopt it in their everyday life. And more importantly, really businesses can adopt it um, to become more sustainable for the future. So the title of the webinar is Our Business, Our Circular Business Models Mainstream. Um, I'm really, really happy to have two companies that I've featured in the series so far with us here today. And that's Anthony from ACS and and Nick from Recono Me, um, and we're going to hear plenty from them today. So um, I actually looked up the definition of mainstream before I came on today. Um, so I thought, what is it, you know, we're really talking about? The linear economy is definitely how we live, right? We buy stuff, it's made, we use it quite often in short term, and then we dispose of it. So we're starting to move towards this idea that that's not sustainable, that's not profitable for us or the planet. And to make mainstream, the definition was that ideas, attitudes and activities that are shared by most people and regarded as normal or conventional. So really, I want us to pick apart today when will circular business models such as reuse, repair, remanufacture be considered as normal and conventional and the way that we do business going forward. So over to Tony and, and Nick now, the first question is what really just describe a little bit about your businesses and what are the main circular business models that you're working on on currently? Nick, do you want to start us off? Sure thing. Thanks for having me on. So Reconomy is about electronics and mostly about computing equipment. And I think all of us have read at least an article and seen some photos of some pretty unfortunate situations involving um, dumps full of discarded electronics. And you know the idea is really, how can we uh, build a business around finding better outcomes for this equipment? So based on that imagery, I think the obvious one is how can we prevent IT waste from ending up in junkyards? But there's also the idea of 
when one person decide, decides that they're finished using a laptop, for example, does it still have some use left in it? So Reconomy is about, for one thing, retrieving electronics that businesses and individuals consider redundant, and then putting that through a process where any sensitive data is removed, and then the devices are refurbished and remanufactured to a um, productively reusable or like new condition, and then they're distributed to new users. And then beyond that, there's also the consideration of how can we then again retrieve those devices. Great. Okay. So what I'm hearing there, Nick, is about extending the life of, of those devices, which contain lots of valuable raw materials, right? And then closing the loop on those devices once they eventually come to their end of their life. So yeah. it's multiple lives, life lives out of one piece of equipment. And when you're getting multiple lives out of something, you've got multiple opportunities for revenue. So you're yeah. extending the value, value chain, if you like. And then finally, you know, ensuring that that, that piece of equipment is, is recycled or, or, or the raw materials recovered. So that's a perfect example of circular economy. Thanks. Great. Tony, give us your, uh, your experience. Thanks, Emma. Uh, yeah, following up from what uh, Nick said, ACS, you know, we're a clothing rental company. We've been renting clothing since 1997 to, it's been men's formal wear. So it's uh, predominantly for black tie events, weddings, functions, um, and it's garments like in Scotland, Highland wear, which is a small percentage of our revenue, but across the UK, dinner jackets, morning wear, tailcoats, to 300 independent retailers across the UK, multiple retailers like Slater's, Moss, Nick's, Debenham's. Um, and that has, we've actually got garments that are over 20 years old. So similar to uh, what Nick spoke about there is about our processes on site, about reusing garments, about taking care of them, cleaning them and repairing them and extending the life cycle of those garments. So that's been the case for many, many years. Over recent years, we've started to partner with ladies dress rental companies where we offer a 3PL service to them. And it's um, companies like Higher Street, My Wardrobe HQ, Endless Wardrobe, Rotaro. So we store their garments on site, we pick pack them, send them to the consumer, come back here and we clean them, we sanitize them and we repair them to extend the life cycle of them, but get multiple uses of them. So we do the same for some baby clothing subscription uh, customers, Graceful Changes, Bundley, um, and our sort of final business stream um, is uh, we facilitate re-commerce and resale for retailers like ASOS and uh, Whistles, where <laughs> these garments have gone out um, on e-com platforms. They come back and they may be dirty or damaged, maybe fake tan or makeup or buttons have come off. And uh, we repair these garments. We take these mark out, marks off. We sanitize them. Because what we do know is if we didn't do these things, these garments would potentially go to a jobber and there's a much higher percentage that they would end up in landfill. So it's about um, increasing the life cycle of the garments and allowing retailers to be more profitable, but also more sustainable. Brilliant, thank you. And I think you hit the nail on the head there. So you've been doing this since 1997, okay? So it's not not new and there wouldn't be many people who haven't hired an outfit for a wedding okay so I think one of the things I'm really keen to get across and I sometimes say the circular business models are hidden in plain sight so they're behind the scenes of your common retailers you know they're behind the scenes of your dry cleaners or your hire shop or, or wherever um, but they are there and they're really you know a really strong part of of the economy so we hear a lot about fast fashion and this sort of thing but actually there's a lot of circularity actually happening so and a real growth in things like hire and subscription models so really really good to have you both on because I think you're really central to, to kind of the story about how mainstream this really really is so actually, I think we're going to go straight into our first poll to get everybody um, engaged and interacting so the first poll is about this mainstream concept and I understand we've got 93 different people here I'd love to know what what sort of breadth of countries what people from so just drop that in the chat as we as we go on but where you live and work 
what circular model do you feel is most mainstream out of? And I've only picked four kind of really generic ones. So it'd just be really interesting to see. Off you go. Hi, getting on sweater, is that running? Yeah, yeah, we have about 68 people who oh, okay. so yeah. everyone, yeah, everyone. So maybe wait for another 10 seconds and then turn. Yeah, sure. I can't take part, so I'll just wait. <laughs> All right, so I'm ending the poll now. Great, so we'll see. Ah, right, okay. Really interesting. So recycling coming out way out, out top on that 69%. So we've adopted this term recycling. We're really familiar with it. It's totally mainstream, okay? So, um, you know, we could, we could discuss all day why that is. How do we then get these other areas, which are higher up the waste hierarchy, if you're familiar with that, to, to, to feature more highly? So that's reuse um, and repair. And at the bottom was remanufacture. I'm not surprised about the remanufacture because that's a kind of more B2B uh, manufacturing industrial. But if you, if you were um, working for Rolls-Royce or Caterpillar or any of these sort of big industrial uh, companies, they would they have been doing remanufacture since since day one and, and their business models depend on it. So again, it is there, it's maybe just in the background. Um, great, okay, so on to, on to our next set of questions then. Reflecting on those poll answers, so recycling came out as, as the big one. Do you guys consider in your line of work, do you consider what you do to be mainstream? And if not, why not? Anthony, do you wanna head off? Um, yeah, thank you. The poll was very interesting there. Um, uh, and I reflect on what you said, Emma, we have, we've been operating a circular business model for over 20 years. Um, and it's been traditional men's formal wear, but you know, it's changing. But there's barriers to change, barriers for rental to growth. Uh, in the UK, compared to North America and Asia, um, subscription clothing rental uh, hasn't grown as fast. It's uh, well behind these. But in the UK, there's a culture of ownership which has been predicated because um, UK um, citizens tend to own their own homes. So that influences their behaviour with clothing. However, um, in terms of, you know, there's also other barriers. The biggest barrier to rental is a perception that clothing is dirty. Um, so I'll touch on both of those things. In terms of users, usership versus ownership, um, UK uh, consumers, we rent lots of things. We rent music, we lease cars, mm -hmm. we uh, use other people's beds. And when I say that, I, I, I say hotel rooms. We all use <laughs> hotel rooms, but there's a, there's a, we're happy to sleep in the same bed as hundreds of people um, I've slept in previously, but we question whether we should wear clothes that someone else has worn. And what we do know is that clothing rental uh, is much cleaner than retail garments. There's a perception that a new retail garment is clean. Studies have shown that retail garments have got so many contaminants on them, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to talk about them here. But what I can say in terms of clothing rental is, we clean all our clothing. We are either dry cleaning or laundry, but we also use ozone technology and it sanitizes garments. And uh, you measure the effectiveness of this ozone technology. Um, it's effective at killing uh, at, uh, against viruses and against germs. And it also, if you measure the, that effectiveness, you measure it in terms of like CFUs, uh, which is colony forming units without going into the, the great detail on it. Um, our garments after ozone technology have got 80% less uh, germs on them than an excellent restaurant preparation area. So these are the sort of sound bites from my perspective that we need to influence consumers um, so that they understand clothing rental is actually cleaner than, than retail um, and make it more mainstream. Uh, I'm lucky I've, I've got a son who's uh, just over one and I have a baby clothing subscription service for him. And I've just taken out a bike subscription service for him um, rather than actually, you know, buy a balanced bike and change it in six months. So I believe that these things are becoming more and more mainstream. 
Brilliant. That's great. Thanks, Tony. And I think you absolutely hit, hit the nail on the head in terms of perception. And like I saw Nick smiling, and I'm sure the same is, is true of electronics. How, how mainstream is, is what you do, Nick, in, in the electronics industry? Yeah, I, I would agree that I think things are definitely starting to shift quickly in, in a positive sense. But I think, uh, you know, as we saw with remanufacturing, zero percent in that poll i mean that was you know which one was in the lead and, and i understand it's it's probably the the most complicated um i would i would mention a few things i think there's a distinction between consumer facing products and businesses and the sort of more enterprises or b2b solutions include including the actual products themselves so if you take the example of a laptop a enterprise grade laptop will actually have much more robust components. So it actually would tend to last longer. Um, whereas a consumer model is often this sort of downward spiral of um, trying to outcompete other brands on cheaper products uh, because consumer tastes are so fickle anyway. And so, you know, the, you might use a laptop for a couple of years and kind of get bored and get something else. So I think, you know, there, there is one major insight there. Mm. Um, there are many more solutions probably because of regulation. So, you know, many companies are now required, well, all companies are now required to have a formal, uh, you know, waste management contract in place. They may, you know, they may still be sending laptops all to a landfill, but at least that will be a government regulated landfill. Um, you know, our, our value add is to not only encourage reuse, but to encourage, uh, you know, to get rid of this taboo, which is associated with used laptops and used electronics because there is very little standardization and there are actually very few players in the UK who will professionally remanufacture a laptop. So if you're not really assured about the quality of the product, maybe you're not getting a decent warranty and maybe the price isn't even that much cheaper than a brand new one yeah. and you have nice you know, uh, advertising dollars behind a new Apple product, for example, then it's quite difficult you know, you really have to be making these decisions based on an assessment of several factors and, you know, understanding the risks and overcoming those. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, you know, there, these things are working in the background and they will organically grow. And as consumer tastes continue to shift, I think it will become more mainstream. But I think the interesting part is how do we pour rocket fuel on this move? Because if it doesn't happen sooner than later, then you know it's going to be too late. Great, I love the rocket fuel. I think that's absolutely what we need. So, the, so the laptop I'm on today is a, a HP um, Elite Book, and it would have gone, you know, been a B two B kind of uh, laptop, um, and it's fantastic. It's the best laptop I've ever owned, and it wasn't expensive. It's a refurb. So, you know, um, so yeah, I've only I've only ever bought refurbs in the last ten years. But I'm switched in that direction. So it's all about how do we switch people in into that direction? And same same with subscription models. So you touched on a couple of things there, Nick, which are really, really important about how we're driven by advertising and marketing and that sort of thing down a route and how we're asking people to sort of um, almost look to the side and say, well, we could do something else. We could buy a you know, subscribe to a, a, um, sign up to a bike subs subscription rather than buying new. And so there's a real awareness piece here. And it, 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 I think you're right about getting lots of other pieces of, of a puzzle in the background. And my next question kind of comes on to that a bit because one of the challenges I see coming like rocket fuel is the climate change, carbon, race to carbon kind of challenge. And all of a sudden, I mean, really all of a sudden in the last 12 months, we're starting to see climate change dropped into you know, Joe Biden's talks and Boris Johnson's talks and and BBC News and all these sorts of things that's so starting to become common parlance. So I wanted to know how you think circularity or circular business models fits with these other sustainability challenges that are coming really fast and hard at us, you know, such as carbon and also things like social, social value, which again, during COVID has really been highlighted. 
Anthony, how do you how do you sort of um, how do you balance that puzzle between circular, which has often been about waste, uh, and carbon and social issues? Yeah, it's a good point. I like Great, big, uh, huge question. Sorry, but uh, yeah, no, no. I liked your uh, poor rocket fuel. Um, I, I would have said do more and faster, but that's a, a very good analogy. Um, we do need to do uh, more. There's lots of synergies with the carbon, though. If we reuse, we cut back on carbon. But you know, social side gets forgotten a lot um, in terms of sustainability, and it is as important as the rest of it. You know, we recognise that here at, uh, at ACS. We try and do things and support our staff. Um, we've set up ACS as an SQA accredited training centre. We offer SVQs in logistics and in garment care. Garment care is an SVQ that is bespoke to rental and to ACS. So it's something that we offer our staff. Um, but we also, um, as well as apprentices on site, you know, learning and getting SVQs, we have four graduate apprentices on site who are studying towards becoming um, managers and getting a, a management degree as part of it. Um, and um, we're also, as I touched on just before we started, we're working towards becoming a B Corp, Emma, because uh, yeah. it's something that um, will help us learn and develop and also uh, make sure we're doing the right thing. And doing the right thing um, encompasses things like we pay the living wage to our, employer, uh, to our employees. It makes it difficult as an SME to compete when you pay more. However, it's the right thing to do. When you hear the horror stories about uh, Leicester, we heard this five years ago, some of the companies in Leicester. And again, last year, you know, paying three pounds to per hour to employees and poor health and safety, it's not right. So we try to think that we do the right thing from a social perspective. Great, yeah, good. Nick, any reflections on on carbon and, and social from your business? Yeah, I think, um, well, the carbon one is, yeah, especially, you know, since the inauguration, there's been a, well, in expectation of the change in uh in you know presidency and you know obviously we, we've already seen this week you're entering the paris agreement so yeah i think there's a lot of optimism equally i think because of covid you know for, for bad reasons or, or good um there seems to be this building consensus that action needs to be taken now there's a sense of urgency which probably we haven't seen at any other point um what is difficult about carbon or chasing carbon targets is that it is not necessarily tangible. And I think it most commonly will have an association of if we want, if we want to reduce carbon, we need to spend money or restrict business activity, um, which, you know, governments will take action, but ultimately the polluters are private businesses, you know, yes, state owned oil companies, I, I was actually reading just this morning, the top 20 polluters are responsible for 35% of all emissions uh, since 1945. And obviously, all 20 are oil companies. Mm. So, uh, well, anyway, I'll put that aside. But I think, you know, chasing carbon targets is, it should be a a measurement of underlying activities or strategies and circular economy is a very effective method of delivering that. Um, in electronics, you may not have this association of fossil fuels and emissions and producing electronics, but because of the high level of engineering, especially in microprocessors, as well as all the plastics, not high engineering, but the plastics themselves, so there actually is quite a large footprint and there will also be quite a lot of critical raw materials, minerals that are mined for the production of you know, everything from batteries to chips. So there's a lot of real sensitivities around the production of these um, devices. And the circular economy introduces a new way to not just recover materials, but the whole devices themselves, as well as components. And so there's a lot more recovery going on, doing a lot more, having a lot more uh, life cycles, more productive hours with the same equipment. 
Yeah, Br brilliant. I mean, you covered a load of th great things there, Nick. And I think you've touched on something, uh, both of you touched on the sort of ethical side of the supply chain, you know, and both areas, fashion and electronics, are you know, really high up there in the danger zone in terms of ethics. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, circularity is great at first revealing that because you need to have transparency to understand, you know, your supply chain to be circular. So that's the first, first battle, isn't it? It's being transparent about that. And the second is working to improve that and putting standards or measures in place to say that, you know, we're not going to operate at this bottom level anymore. We're going to raise the level. And you can do that by building more value into the whole supply chain. As we said about revenue comes through each of those loops. So, uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's a great um, opportunity to increase social value through through circularity. Yeah, I did also want to make another point that yeah. this idea of cascading. Mm. So the I think it's especially relevant with products that go through a sort of a, a cycle of obsolescence, i.e. electronics where you know we we talked about enterprise products and how uh, well made they are in you know one of the previous questions so it not everybody can afford those products because they're necessarily more expensive so in your first life cycle you may have a wealthy business that acquires you know a premium laptop but once they use it for three years then inevitably because of the way they operate and also because of accounting standards they have written those down to zero and so it's now time for them to replace them. So then that laptop is still a very good laptop, but it is no longer cutting edge. And so it will serve a very productive purpose, but with a different user. So yes. it is a sort of an allocation or a distribution question so that these devices can be then distributed to people who value them at that point, at the new point in time. Right, yeah, so I like that in cascading. I think it's a, it's a really good point. And it makes me laugh when people say, who buys these thousand thousand dollar iPhones? Right? Or thousand pound iPhones, right? Well, they're only a thousand pounds for a while, aren't they? And then they cascade, you know. So that iPhone could be resold three or five times before it gets to, you know, a year seven child going to school and it's their first iPhone in, in five years time or whatever. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of questions that have come through actually about um, this topic of kind of planned obsolescence, which I think you've touched on, Nick. Um, you could say the same about fashion, Anthony. It's this kind of obsession with the new and the shiny and the, you know, not, not wanting something that's been refurbished. So, but it's very well known in, in electronics, isn't it? So um, there's a question here from Catherine Wheatman that's actually a couple of on the same sort of vein. Um, for tech, especially laptops, et cetera, manufacturers, uh, prevent updating of, oper of operating systems on older models. Uh, eventually, it means you can't download software, so it becomes unusual. How do we unusable? How do we overcome or persuade them to to change this planned obsolescence approach? So, without going into too much detail, because I'm not sure everyone will understand, but this is something that's a bit of a hot topic at the moment, isn't it? Are we seeing a move away from planned obsolescence towards more circularity? If not, how do we how do we encourage it? Yeah, well, not in a mainstream sense, but I think there are actually a couple of interesting signs. Um, so uh, Google has become a much more prominent. So obviously everybody knows Google from search and software and data, but they are also um, making hardware. So Chromebooks, um, you know, it's also licensed. Uh, so they run an Android operating system or Chrome based operating system. And, you know, many of the leading manufacturers make uh, hardware that is compatible with Google um, software. So Google had published that they will only support Chromebooks with software updates for five years since manu after manufacture, which was met with criticism, even though it's probably much longer. It's about the same for Apple and, you know, it's just not such a public thing. Um, but recently they've started extending that from five to eight years and Google have purchased a company called Neverware and Neverware are that the whole company is built around um, building a very light operating system for older machines like the ones that were mentioned in the question that aren't receiving software updates and effectively switching any machine out of a Windows environment onto a Chrome-based environment. So, you know, yes, you're still tied to Google this time, 
but uh, you know you are supported for much much longer. So, for example, if we receive very old equipment that virtually all of our competitors would be recycling, we can actually load this software and have it uh, run in a useful way for a select group of uh, with of users who have you know limited requirements, just word processing or internet or or what whatever. Mm, great. Good. Yeah, good. OK, that's really useful. I'm going to uh, flip things up a bit and move on to the second poll switch, if that's OK. And we'll talk about some of the ways that we feel we can accelerate this move. So this rocket fuel. Um, so what elements would accelerate um, a move to, to circular economy? What do you think about this? So we've got five um, selections. Do we feel this is a global agreement? SDG stands for um, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are a set of goals set by the UN. The Paris Agreement that Nick referred to, which is uh, around climate change. Or do we think other measures like taxation, consumer awareness, this link that we've started to talk about between circularity and carbon, or increased uptake, uptake of social value stroke ethical business. So B Corp that Anthony mentioned is a really fast growing movement. Which elements do we think would help accelerate the move to a more circular economy? Sweater, you tell me when you've got the numbers. Oh, that was quick. Wow. Okay. So, so two out front there with uh, taxation measures, which is amazing. It's not usually a consumer favorite. Um, maybe we'll dig into that in a minute. Um, and greater awareness. So this touching on this perception piece. You know, what is the impact of what we're doing? Uh, two there on climate change coming out high, which is interesting, because I do think there's a really strong link between circularity and carbon. And I think that's something that if we need a lever, if you like, to hook more people in, um, I think that is something we can we can certainly build on. That's great. Thanks very much. So, so off the back of those that, those poll questions, then if we can just dive into that a little bit. And I know this is something we've touched on uh, panel before we came on air. What what are your views on on taxing polluting organisations versus maybe incentivizing sustainability? So, is this carrot and stick kind of approach? Nick, you've you've touched on some of the big polluters, but you know we all we all eat food, we all move around the world, we all consume energy. So, you know, we're, we're kind of inherently involved in that. In fact, I read a stat just this week that said the, the global dairy industry has, the, has, a, has a carbon impact the same as the UK. You know, so it's as big as a country. So all industries have, have, have got, a, you know, have got an impact and a role to play here. So how do you feel about maybe we should be looking to tax some of those impacts differently. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, Tony, do you want to go? Yeah, uh, it's interesting taxation versus incentivizing uh, consumers and businesses. Um, from an ACS perspective, we think we don't need to be incentivized to do the right thing. However, saying that, um, it would be good to create more of a level playing field between clothing rental and fast fashion, maybe incentivize the consumer to do the right thing um, in terms of one way we could do that is the removal of VAT on rental clothing, yeah. um, because that would absolutely make a difference. Um, in fact, we've been, we've been trying to influence change on this front for several years now, and we recently sent a document to the UN uh, prior, we spoke about COP26, COP26 is about 10 miles away from this facility. And uh, we're excited to hopefully get involved in things there. Um, but um, the UN document, um, one of the managers at UNFCCC has committed to share that document with his colleagues uh, with a view to potentially influence some change. We talk about you know, energy, uh, transport, but um, there's not much to talk about fashion and it's the second biggest polluter globally after oil. So what can we do to make a difference and incentivize consumers and businesses to make um, the right decisions? Um, but something else that was also touched on is culturally, we, we have a, a problem uh, in the UK 
Um, you need to only need to walk down the street or drive anywhere, and there's litter everywhere. That culture impacts, uh, pervades other areas of society in terms of clothing because people are too um, re ready to dump things in the bin after it's been worn once, or maybe not at all. So we need to change con consumers' beliefs about how they do things, and behavioural change is more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think you're right. In the same way that plastic um, has, you know, has been raised, the awareness raised through through Blue Planet, you know, that was a, a, a tipping point, if you like, um, momentous moment. It certainly changed changed the the, the, the sort of direction of travel. Um, I think we're going to see more of that coming through on carbon. And when you when you uh, start to understand the kind of carbon picture and where is that carbon coming from. Um, we think about 45% of the actions that we need to take are around product or around embodied carbon. So once we've dealt with things like uh, green energy into the grid, and once we've stopped investing in coal and all these things you're seeing in the news, and once we've stopped using you know, oil and we've moved the, the grid over to, to more renewables, and once we've electrified transport, we're going to be stuck with this big embodied carbon challenge, which is in product. And like you say, fashion, I mentioned dairy, you know, Nick mentioned oil, which just about powers every product on the planet at the moment, but electronics, anything that uses water, anything that uses power. So every time we buy something, we, 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 we have a carbon impact. And I think that's going to take a you know, little bit of time to, to, for the penny to sink. I love the idea about the VAT on, on rental. Uh, Nick, any thoughts about that in your industry? The taxation versus incentives yeah i think there's there's been similar talk about how to removing vat from uh refurbished or repair yeah, yeah. Uh, and encouraging you know the actual industry of repairers as well which i think would be very helpful um you know we spoke a bit about cascading mm -hmm. um there are a lot of cheap products electronic products that are being put on the market which make which are very negative for the environment, but attractive because of their low prices. And often, um, you know, some of our refurbished devices do compete on price. You know, so they're they're sold at a similar price to new but cheap devices. And you know, we can proudly say that our devices would last longer. But I think um, it is it is kind of a lonely fight for us to try and build materials and create awareness around that. So I think, as we've seen with the incredible success of building up green energy infrastructure based on heavy government subsidies, um, you know, it is money, money follows the government and subsidies and taxation. Mm. So I think it's an incredibly powerful tool because, you know, in one fell swoop, you can change an industry, whereas for one small company, you have to, uh, you know, make sure all your employees are happy, uh, grow your company, and then campaign. So I think yeah. it's, it's a completely different path. Things don't happen as quickly. Um, I would also mention that I think there, you know, it is a very difficult task to come up with correct tax incentives. I think the, you know, the voluntary carbon offset market is one that's particularly plagued, even though it's trying to do good um, you know, often I've, I've read some articles that suggest that a lot of the projects don't actually deliver anything near the, um, you know, the, the touted carbon savings. Um, and I think that many countries are still subsidizing fossil fuel producers because, you know, it's still, it is still such a critical part of everything, you know, um, it's it just I think uh, if we suddenly removed all fossil fuels we oh, would yes. be surprised by the products that would disappear yeah um, oh yeah 100 percent. so this is the whole thing about you know we're in a fossil economy that that is the mainstream okay so how are we how are we starting to shift that and we've picked on a, a few things I just want to take one of the questions that's come into Q&A from Olivia uh, just out of interest because you guys are both running businesses and like you say you're sort of disrupting and, and moving things forward could there be um, a better measure of embedded carbon in products so that reuse, remanufacturing can be integrated? Or, and I just want to ask the question, do you guys, 
think you'll be carbon labeling your products anytime soon? Tony? Uh, I'll jump in there. It's, it's a, a great question. You know, you see on food, you see the calories and you know, green, red, amber, whether it's good for you, the fat content, carbon. Um, what I would say is what we're working towards is we're working towards a sustainability clock. So we're hopeful that uh, we can get something in place that every time we rent a garment, it shows the positive impact of that garment um, in terms of CO2 emissions, water, um, how it's multiple uses um, mitigate the, the manufacture of that garment. So that's a, a thing that we'd hopefully share with all our partners to show the positive impact they're having um, on the environment by renting clothes. Yeah, absolutely. And it touches on, and Tara's mentioned in her Q&A here about, um, you know, the affordability of, of sustainability has, has become a topic as well, you know, that that maybe, um, need, you know, sustain, more sustainable products are seen as more expensive or they might be, you know, um, out of reach for many families. Whereas the, the reverse is true when you look at, you know, reducing your consumption and reducing your energy usage should save you money, right? And so we need to be able, we need to really make these these options as, as affordable as possible. And I think the taxation thing could help do that um, and, and drive this change in consumer, you know, just as we see, as Nick was saying, and I don't think that the messages have to be that large even, you know, it's just a direction of travel. Um, and most of us are followers at the end of the day. So, so when things start to shift in a, in a, a general direction, um, we were talking before we came on air about wearing masks and how a year ago none of us would have thought that it would be mainstream to wear a mask in the supermarket and now you cannot enter a supermarket and you're and it, you're almost sort of outlawed if you're the person you know who isn't wearing a mask so we can change that's been proven despite the fact that everyone says they don't like change we can change so um well, i'm really you know i'm really excited i just think we've got to get enough of these messages messages out there good okay so just in terms of messaging then, we're going to go a little bit sideways before we come back to some of the Q&A. And this was a question I think, uh, Anthony, you, you posed. How much greenwashing are we seeing in industry now? And do we think that's a barrier? So when we're talking about messaging to people, it's really important. How much, you know, you think that could be a, a benefit or a barrier? Tony, did, was it the reason for that question? Yeah, well, um... You know, you hear about all the things that multinationals are doing in the Amazon and um, all the sort of good PR stories. You know, you know, who am I to question these things? Um, what I would say is the things that we've done on site, um, we have won environmental business awards, they're independently assessed and externally verified. Um, and potentially, maybe the government needs to put in legislation around these things so that they are measured uh, and there's a standardization uh, across uh, all fronts. We're trying to do things which are very visible as well, like potentially put solar panels on the roof of our building. We're uh, installing electrical car pods with uh, solar panels above them, uh, powering those car pods. But, um, you know, we, we need to all do more on this front uh, and make sure that we're not, um, it's not PR, it's real tangible things. Mm. Yeah, great. Nick, any, any reflections on that? What are you seeing in your industry in terms of messages going out? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think that the PR machine is, has proven itself extremely effective and small sort of um, clickbaity articles by very large companies that have invested a very minute percentage of their annual earnings and such initiatives get end up getting a lot of attention, um, which is not moving the industry forward in a meaningful way. So I think, you know, also reflecting on your previous question about having, um, you know, better labeling that maybe creates awareness about what is the embodied impact of this product. So it's also something that we've had from, from an early day, and now we are trying to take it to the next phase, working with a university, um, not just looking at emissions, but also the materials, mm. um, the potential social impacts, 
So right. getting a, a holistic picture, but you know, I think Anthony, it, it's it's critical that we do have some sort of agreed um, methodology for having a third party that verifies this. And you know, we we mentioned B Corp. We've been a B Corp for for almost a year now, and I think it's it's a you know it's great to see so many new B Corps. I think it's the the number of UK B Corps have probably doubled in the last year, which is amazing. But it is still it's a movement, but it's not a mainstream movement. And, you know, it's it is very easy if you ask a company, what are your revenue objectives for, you know, five years out, then any well to do company is going to tell you exactly what they plan on doing. And then if you said, well, what are you going to do on sustainability? What are you going to do environmentally? You know, what? how are you going to improve? How are you going to measure that? Then I, I imagine the response is going to be completely lukewarm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, I have sympathy with that. It's it's new. It might not be new for us, but it's new for a lot of people. And people uh, fear getting things wrong, particularly if they're going to invest a lot of time in it. So I think that's where B Corp works very well because it's very structured. Uh, whereas if you uh, go to look now, you know, today, to come put me come put in your product, you will very quickly get into uh, quite, you know, tricky, technical, um, I've heard it referred to dark arts before, you know, um, because it's, you know, it's hugely complex. Um, I do think one of the things that we've got on our side, which we maybe didn't have five or 10 years ago is, is, is heightened consumer awareness. And I think the more that consumers ask questions, either it be through social media, you know just at the store that really is starting to, to 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 make a difference because i've worked with clients who who have the pure reason that they're acting on this is is uh consumer kind of backlash or or, or um not being able to answer consumer questions you can argue is that you know should they have acted on it before probably but i think this this emphasis on the more informed consumer is really really important and, and you know, people having a voice and saying, you know, I don't want to accept this anymore. Um, tell me what you're going to do about it. Um, so there's two, two handed. There's the, the business leaders and then there's the consumers leaders who have got a much bigger voice, I think, than they did have on this. Because frankly, they were kind of in the dark, you know, about impacts. So, um, yeah, great. OK, so I think that's 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 really brought us around to sort of my my final question. And if we've got time after this, I'll take a couple more of the Q&A. What three steps would you both encourage a business to take to become more circular? So after this webinar, they're thinking, well, what do I do? You know, and one of the questions I had actually before the webinar was, how does a regular brand with most of its markets never been touched by circularity, where do they start? Okay, so, so have a think about that if you were talking to a business that had never started with circularity, what sort of first steps would you tell them to take? Anthony? Um, yeah, well, we touched on this earlier um, in terms of reducing waste. You know, that can be uh, what we've done on site. We've had a big program of this and we've actually cut down our waste management costs by 70% and nothing on our site goes to landfill. But it started with things as simple as we removed waste paper bins from all our staff from their desks so it makes them take their rubbish up and take it to a recycling point, gets them more active, and then they start to split the waste down. So very simple things, even things like in our canteen, we um, stopped um, making food uh, speculatively, depending on what people fancy, but we've, uh, we cook to order now, and that's cut down on food waste. So simple things that make a difference. Um, I would also say that uh, reducing energy is, uh, is easy to do. I'll give you an example of something we've done on site. We were fortunate enough to get a soft loan from Zero Waste Scotland, and we replaced all our lights on site, which were halogens, and there were hundreds of them, if not thousands out there, and we replaced them with smart LEDs. You can run like a smart LED, a strip light, about seven of them for the same price as a one halogen. So that even while we are paying back that soft loan, we're saving £20,000 a year and we're cutting down our CO2 emissions by about 16 tonnes. So that's that's energy. Um, 
as a, a company that do clothing rental, we launder lots of garments. Um, so we use water, but um, we've cut down on our water also. Um, so when we have water, which goes through our dry cleaning machines to cool down our stills, to um, turn the chemical from a gas back into a liquid to reclaim as much of it as possible, that water leaves our dry cleaning machines and it com comes out hot. So we then put that into a tank which feeds our washing machine. So it's pre-warmed, so it saves less energy for warming water for, for our washing machines. Even in that closed loop system, if the water's um, too, too hot again to go in the dry cleaning machines, it goes through adiabatic coolers, which don't use any energy in the north face of our building. So these things all save us uh, waste, energy, water. And um, lastly, some of the things that um, maybe are sort of back to the social side of what we do, it's about how we how we recruit and how we um, bring on new staff, how we work with organisations like Young Enterprise Scotland, like uh, EYW Glasgow and Lanarkshire. Uh, we work with organisations that uh, allow us to recruit um, staff from disadvantaged backgrounds, from disabled staff. Um, and we've had a big programme on site, particularly do during COVID, it's been important for us that uh, we've supported staff with mental health because um, you know everyone has suffered during COVID and it's an area that there's always been focus on for us, but particularly during COVID, we've, we've run some extra programs to support staff. So these are things which are relatively easy, small steps for all businesses that I would, I would say that uh, uh, I would absolutely recommend based on our experience. You know, that, that's brilliant, Tony, and it fits in with a question here from, from Adrian, do employees find value in working for C circular economy orientated businesses? And you've touched on something there, because when you look at the butterfly diagram for circular economy, it's quite complicated and you think, well, where do I fit? You know, I'm, I'm not an industrial organisation and I'm not in agri agriculture or whatever. But what you've touched on there is businesses are full of humans, right? And, and those humans make stuff and use energy and use materials. So you could start with the human piece, you know, and do your staff, what's the feedback you get from them about some of the actions that you've taken? We have lots of comms with staff from employee engagement surveys to breakfast briefs, which haven't uh, happened as often since uh, COVID, but um, uh, we get as much feedback as possible from them. And um, I'd say everyone has been very positive to the things we've done. It was actually, our staff that um, suggested some of the things um, about recycling and about waste. So they have driven change. So we have um, working uh, parties that look at sustainability, that look at health and safety. So, you know, we engage with them as much as possible. So we've had very positive feedback on the things that we have done because the, it's, a, it's a team that have created those or come up with those ideas them, themselves. Great. And I say you know, almost exclusively the businesses I work with, the ones that are most successful are those that use their staff's brains to come up with the ideas because they know their job best, you know, and, and there's lots of niggly things that niggle people all the time. They say, oh, why, why are we wasting this? You know, we could do this better. Um, and, you know, it also sparks, it sparks the innovate, innovative side of people. We want you to come up with tomorrow's solution. You know, so so I think that's a really good uh, recommendation for people. Nick, what three recommendations would you give to a business wanting to be more circular? Yeah, the team one was uh, one of mine, but I, I think, as you say, every I mean, if you recruit a strong team, then everybody every day is going to have some thoughts about why are we doing this this way? Why don't we do it this other way? And I think that thinking is guided by the vision of the business and what you say is important. And so if you make it a priority and let it trickle down, then changes will organically happen. It's a very powerful thing. I think, you know, the obvious thing is you have to not just think about your direct impacts, although, you know, obviously that's important if you haven't already thought about it, but your sort of indirect impacts as well, all the, this idea of externalities so what actions that you're taking could actually be causing negative side effects that mean that means you need to speak to your suppliers you need to you know sort of take a step back or take a bird's eye view look at everything that you're doing um you know you could say that well you know we don't operate a fleet of vehicles so we don't have a footprint but then you could be relying on 
you know, you, you need to look at which third party logistics companies you're using. Some have larger uh, electric car fleets or, or have made commitments, or measure their carbon footprint, all, all those sort of things, I think, um, are very important and often lead to some pretty interesting conversations between supplier and client. Um, you know, and some, some of these companies themselves are trying to, you know, we work with uh, in terms of packaging for our refurbished products. We have one supplier in particular who has sort of made it their banner that they are going to be the supplier of sustainable uh, packaging. And that's been quite interesting. And, you know, you realize that maybe you shouldn't always be going for the cheapest if there is a strategic alliance that you can form and somebody's going to help you um, do better on one of your major company objectives. The other, uh, so the third is start from high impact, low cost, quick wins, get that feeling of momentum. I think that is really quite rewarding for, uh, you know, especially a staff member who proposes an idea and then the business takes it up, uh, you know, that encourages more of that sort of behavior. Great, six great recommendations. And my brain was just sort of firing off about that. And in the news this week was, uh, I think Apple have changed their uh, execs bonus structure to include a 10%, um, you know, 10% kind of weighting on sustainability. Um, I wondered if that meant that the other 90% 90, 90 was uh, to do business unsustainably. So, you know, for me, you're absolutely right, Nick. It's about change comes from the top, the vision, you know, why not incentivize your staff financially to come up with great sustainable ideas? Um, I think we all know if we're recruiting younger people, this is really, really high up their agenda. And having worked for a B Corp previously, every single interview I had, you know, the interviewee said, I really want to work for B Corp. So it's, it's really starting to be really important. I loved your point, Nick, about supply chains. Um, and I'm sure Tony's doing the same, forming partnerships is really, really valuable. Um, and I think we've seen during COVID that um, a short supply chain is a good supply chain. Um, and there's a question here from, from Margaret about what are your opinions on, on localization? And, you know, circular economy works very well when it's decentralized. So we have local economies. Um, I just wondered if any of you had a, a final thought on that in terms of how do we bring circular economy home how do we how do we solve this kind of global supply chain issue we've only got two minutes okay. Anyone have any thoughts on that yeah i think um it's an interesting opportunity i think you know one of the major questions for society is which jobs will survive with the sort of digitization that you know the advent of technology doing more and more um i think repair refurbishment, reverse logistics is actually a very interesting one that creates localized industries. Um, you know, ultimately you may have one highly sophisticated facility that does the sort of most complicated of procedures, but you will still need to have local supply chains that bring you back those products. Great, yeah, and really good opportunity for low carbon travel within cities, all that sort of, you know, the hub and spoke kind of model. Anthony, in, in the last minute, have you got any thoughts on, because obviously your business is all over the UK and probably Europe. How, how are you working to sort of keep those supply chains? As local it's, it's a good point. Just to touch on what Nick said is we partner with um, carriers who are carbon neutral, uh, but we are uh, acutely aware of the shipping aspect of these things. So we do offset a little, but we've also created things like uh, reusable shipping bags. So it absolutely removes consumables from the process. And if we're partnering with um, carriers that are carbon neutral, then we get the benefit of economies of scale and how that has a positive impact on um, the energy and um, the cleaning of the garments um, for rental. Right. Well, thanks everyone. That's been really fascinating. It went off in lots of directions I wasn't expecting, but they're all great. Um, we've managed to answer about half the questions that are in the Q&A, but there's a few others in the chat that I hope people have been keeping up with. Feta, over to you to wrap up. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you, Nick. Uh, that was a very good discussion. And uh, like Emma mentioned, I think we just 
we went in quite a few different directions today and uh, thanks a lot for letting the conversation flow that way and with respect to the questions uh, we will try to send the questions to the panelists and uh, get the response when you put it up on our website or uh, the webinar will be up on our website in a couple of weeks up until then since you've registered you will have access to go back and listen to it whenever you want to so thanks a lot folks uh, have a good day in the show part of the world you're at and if you haven't signed up for our newsletter please do so and uh, you will know more about all of our panelists when you go to their website. There's an, enough information about them there. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Sweater?